My name is Aaron Shafawalaf. I have been a member of Faith Community Church since November of 2020. I come from Utah, where I spent 15 years doing evangelism. I moved in 2005 to Orem, Utah, with the ambition of doing evangelism to a Mormon-concentrated area with very little Christian presence. I hit the ground running, going door to door, handing out pamphlets in front of high schools and going to local parades. I wanted to do local street evangelism, regular street evangelism, where I knew there would be substantial foot traffic, so we moved to Salt Lake City, up north, and we spent 13 years there. And uh, minus winter, uh, I did weekly evangelism at Temple Square on Thursday nights. Thursday is when the Mormon Tabernacle Choir practices. There were not only locals, but large tour buses that came to the square to hear the choir. We'd set up at the north gate, pray, hand out tracts, and spend hours in conversation, intersecting people who were often waiting to cross the street. And I say hours, I really mean hours. Many times I'd come home at midnight or 1 a.m., having sat in a circle on the grass alongside a believer or two, talking to a few young adults about the gospel. We'd pray before the evening began for one good conversation. And the Lord lavished us with far more. I say we and us because it wasn't only me. One of the joys of regular evangelism was teaming up with evangelistic believers throughout the Salt Lake Valley. Evangelists can be an eccentric bunch. God uses different personalities. Some of us were friendly, or cheerful, or super serious, or shy, or even socially awkward. But we all came to talk with strangers about the gospel. Working together, we formed the sweetest of relationships. I have a soft spot in my heart for evangelists, even the weird ones. As we'd wait for people to approach our intersection, we often got to talk about our lives, our the about theology and about evangelism, and we watched each other. We caught a lot from each other, working together. It's hard to work with a bunch of believers who love the Lord and love the lost and not have your rough spots shaved down over time. We learned to be easily pleased and optimistic. If we could just have two minutes of your time, we'd ask you some questions and show you a Bible verse and share some basic gospel truths. And usually if you gave us two minutes, you'd give us five. And usually if you gave us five minutes, you'd give us ten, and so on. Given the tour buses, sometimes people would come at us in such large numbers that we couldn't manage to get a tract out in everyone's hand. So I quickly took to preaching, even if I only had a minute. It was a kind of tour guide preaching. I'd present myself as a born-again Christian and address the whole group who were waiting to cross the street, usually to the horror of the Mormon tour guide. <laughs> I'd share a few facts that the official tour guides were unlikely to share, and then try in earnest to summarize the gospel in what little time I had. This was useful not merely for sharing the gospel, but also for piquing the interest of some in the crowd and enter into conversation. Sorry. For piquing the interest of some in the crowd to stop and enter into conversation with some of the believers. Hence, preaching to crowds became a catalyst for more conversational evangelism. Someone so, so when someone says they prefer gentle conversational evangelism over lively, provocative preaching, that dichotomy puzzles me. I ask, why not both? Temple Square was a cultural epicenter. People came from around the world to ski, and students came to study at the University of Utah. Local Mormons came to the square and passed through, or passed through to the nearby LDS Business College, or even came to do temple work at the temple. There was a sizable ex-Mormon 
agnostic, atheist, and LGBTQ community in Salt Lake City. You'd be uh, surprised it's quite uh, prominent there. And a variety of people were in town for business or attending a conference at a local convention center. So it wasn't uncommon to have spoken to Mormons, atheists, and perhaps Buddhist or Muslim. It's pretty interesting the different kinds of people we got to talk to. Our topics of conversation ranged from anywhere from creation to ethics, sin, the historicity of the Bible, the doctrines of the Trinity, the death and resurrection of Christ, and especially the cross, the imputation of righteousness, grace, and the forgiveness of sins. If you came and were passive in handing out tracts, you'd get into a conversation. But if you worked hard to engage people, it was even more rewarding. If you asked us how the night went, it's rare that we could tell you that someone on the spot gave their life to the Lord. But we could tell you all about a conversation we had with so-and-so, and how it went, how, perhaps how well it went, and how much of the gospel we were able to share, or what kind of objection we were able to field, or some sort of question we wanted to go home and study more about. It's really interesting when you do evangelism, it, uh, it fuels you to go home and study for hours. You could have one weird conversation for five minutes and you just got caught off guard and hey, I don't know about that or I'd like to understand that better or feel that better. So you'll, you'll read for weeks just because of the catalyst of one conversation. Or sometimes we could tell you how awful a conversation went. Sometimes people were arrogant or rude. And sometimes we ourselves had to repent of not showing courtesy or kindness or patience. But we'd debrief together. We'd rejoice over, over what went well, especially over a Christian's first evangelistic conversation. This is your first night. How'd it go? That was great. And we were sympathetic to our weaknesses, encouraging each other, in the Lord toward maturity. The whole affair was a recipe for joy, for rehearsing the gospel over and over, for growing in our doctrine and in our friendship. We'd carpool. That quickly became a staple of the experience. We'd meet at a house, and we'd pack it in, and we'd chatter all the way up to Temple Square to our parking spot, and we'd drive back home together. Although that part became more difficult, because one of us might be in a really good conversation and need to stay longer than reasonable. Mm. But we'd rarely want to interrupt a good conversation. It was worth it to wait. And at the, at the end of each night, we'd pray, try and remember all the names of the people we had spoken to. And then we'd sing. And then we'd grab a drink at McDonald's and chatter the whole way home. This was the highlight of my week. It's hard not to tear up thinking about it. I love love my friends. I uh, love my friends that I made through this. Um, these are the best of my friends. It's, there's just a few greater ways to make friends in Christ than to work together, sharing the gospel together. This is what a typical Thursday night looked like. Very simple, not dramatic. That's the temple in the background. It's Bradley talking to some unbeliever. I tried not to take pictures of people's faces, or I wasn't really much into like, like live video conversations like that. But um, every so often, I'd try to do some video. But uh, this was the highlight of my week. I'd try to recruit more to join us. If you were afraid, if evangelism seemed like a black box, and you needed to see it in action to have it demystified, you could come and simply shadow us. Sharing the gospel with a stranger isn't complicated. By worldly standards, it's quite mundane. You could even say, by worldly standards, it's quite boring. If you've seen, quite, if you've seen dramatic YouTube videos of evangelistic encounters, well, those are not the norm. It's less like TV and more like your living room. It's less like seminary and more like Sunday school. You don't have to have a strong personality. You don't have to know a lot. In fact, we had a lot of new believers, eager to join, passionate to share what little they knew of the great Savior 
that had just saved them. I remember some believers, it was like three weeks after being saved, and they were on the street sharing the gospel with us. I mean, don't, you don't want to squelch that. You know, I'm like, brother. And, you know, they, they fumble with their words and they say things that make you cringe. And you're like, That's all right. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll work at this. This is great. <laughs> if you came, you'd hear the beautiful gospel recounted over and over that while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And you'd see bold, even if also timid, believers defending the truth of doctrines like the Trinity speaking to atheists and Mormon polytheists. Once a year, a few hours south of us, there was an event in rural Utah called the Mormon Miracle Pageant in Manti, Utah. We'd call it the Manti Pageant. It lasted a week and a half, it was like a musical that, so called, that uh, told the so-called history of the Book of Mormon. Over the span of a week and a half, anywhere from 70,000 to 120,000 Mormons would come and gather to watch the outdoor pageant. They'd claim their spot on the grass. There was a large field in front of, an outdoor, of, a, of a temple where they, against the, the, against the side of the the slope, they'd have the, the event. They'd claim their spot, mosey toward the booths for food and fun, it's until the pageant starts, there was lots to do. And they'd pass over, this is an evangelist's dream, a public domain, closed road, where Christians were free to share their faith. Anywhere from a, a 50 to sometimes over 150 Christians all around the Christians, all around the country, would meet in the morning, train, sing, and pray, and prepare for the evening. After dinner, we'd meet on the street and spend hours talking into the night to a sea of Mormons, many of them teens and young adults, sometimes whole Mormon youth groups with matching T-shirts. Like 30 of them would just come and some young uh, teenage set of believers would be sharing their, their faith for the first time just with the onslaught of, and sometimes young sharing their faith with the old. It was an, an awesome sight to be off the, on the street and then just to pan around and see a sea of small group conversations happening everywhere. Some of them experienced evangelists, many of them youth groups and young adult groups visiting, sharing their faith for the first time. After dinner, we'd meet on the street. I'll show you some pictures here. This is just what, this is lots of small group conversations like this happening on the street. Lots of these conversations happening. Oh, you'll see Jamin up there preaching. Um, after dinner, sorry, not after dinner. Mm. lost my spot. After dinner, we'd meet on the street and spend hours talking into the night, talking to a sea of Mormons, many of them teens and young adults. This is where I learned to preach to large crowds, to keep attention and interact with hecklers. Whole teams of Christians would come and pull off Mormons who had gathered to see the spectacle of a young man with his arms forcibly gesticulating in the air. So the idea is, I'll be the bad cop, cop. I'll I'll get on a stool, I'll be the fool, I will preach, I will gather a crowd. And these young Christians would come and, what do you think of that? And they'd have conversations (laughs) and pick people off. And it, it it was a success if I could pull 12 people in and they'd all get picked off, so I'd lose my crowd. Because <laughs> all the Christians would just eat them up, and, and in a good way. They would, they would pull them in and into conversation. Most of the evangelism, though, was a lot like Temple Square, consisting of low-key, one-on-one conversations, or small group discussions, tag-teaming with other believers. After the pageant start, uh, started, so it started real late at night, so we had quite a... Uh, segment of time to do evangelism. 
and our conversations died down, we'd head to Miller's, a local burger joint. <coughs> Imagine a small restaurant, shoulder to shoulder, with a hundred Christians. I don't think I got a picture in there of this. So just imagine this tiny little burger joint, um, like a mosh pit of Christians, uh, of all the evangelists that get together, having just spent, you know, three hours doing intense evangelism, and now they're debriefing and they're talking together about how it went, and they're and they're so hungry, and uh, and then in some of the booths in the restaurant. There's still conversations going on, evangelistic conversations continuing. Some people would skip the pageant just to keep talking with us. Uh, one odd site that was neat, became normal to us, is that there was a, a polygamous compound that would send their young men out to do proselytizing to recruit mainstream Mormons into a, a polygamous group. And these poor uh, 18 and 19 year old young men, really just boys, um, in some sense, they, they had spent much of their life in an isolated way, and this was their first exposure to sort of the outside world. So we didn't see them much, much of a threat at all. It was just like, I mean, they're, they're not like, oh, no, they're going to convince our you know, young adults to join a polygamous group. Um, you could recognize them by their pastel button-up shirts. They kind of had almost like a cultural uniform. And so the young Christians that would come from Texas and and Florida, and Idaho, they would swallow these kids up. We would feed them every night. We'd share the gospel with them for hours, and they were there the whole time. So every night, they're perhaps at a booth, and another set of Christians were just pouring themselves. I mean, these kids heard the gospel from 20 different angles. And they'd become friends, you know, as much as a, an enemy of the gospel can become a friend. Sometimes they called them frenemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. The night would end, and we'd get up, and we'd do it all over again. By the end of the week, we'd, ha we'd be severely sleep-deprived, running on caffeine. Believers would travel back home, excited to come back next year. But for some of us who came from Salt Lake City, this was like a crowded and more noisy Temple Square experience. And we could get right back to that the next Thursday. Over the years, we saw some people come to faith. We also saw, saw some people depart from the faith, even some evangelists. Most of the people we shared the gospel with, we never saw again. That's stranger evangelism, typically. Some of us joined a church plant that was formed in part by relationships made in evangelism. This was the mission church where I come from in Salt Lake City. So that's my extended introduction and background in evangelism. I hope to, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. He says apostles, prophets, pastors, and evangelists have a role to play in equipping the body who itself does what? The ministry. The work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. I want to stir you up and encourage you to do evangelism, even if you're not an evangelist. For the next five weeks, I think it's five weeks, we will try to think clearly about evangelism and the gospel. Each week, I will try to give you something you can immediately use in conversation, a tool on your belt. Then we will take some time for questions and conversation. Let's start with this. What is evangelism? The word evangelism is similar to fishing. I might say, I'm going fishing, and mean to include things related to actual fishing, like walking around a lake or operating the boat. But if you said you were going fishing, and you never cast out your line, I would object. You're not fishing. You're just enjoying the lake. In a similar way, I object to the use of the term evangelism when one never shares the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost. Evangelism is not handing out free water bottles. It is not a mutually curious interfaith 
dialogue. That was a common substitute for evangelism in Utah among churches that wanted a very good reputation with the Mormon community for not really confronting or engaging or uh, stinging the conscience with the, with the life and death urgent matters of, of doctrine and heresy and faith and salvation. Let's just have a dialogue together. That is not evangelism. Evangelism is not delivering humanitarian aid. It is not discussing philosophical arguments for the existence of God. And it's not even inviting people to church. You might do such things, and those are good things to do, with the goal of engaging in evangelism. I like to call it pre-evangelism. But these are not in themselves evangelism, strictly speaking. Evangelism, precisely speaking, is verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with a call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and for the receiving of eternal life. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But I do use the term evangelism loosely to include the general activity that one engages in with the immediate goal of sharing their faith. It might help to have some different categories for evangelism. This kind of evangelism. Consider the following two. Relational evangelism and stranger evangelism. Relational evangelism involves long-term, slower communication with people you have likely future contact with. I will see you again. You're my, you're my friend. You're my coworker. You're my brother. You're my spouse, my neighbor. Stranger evangelism involves more direct, short-term communication with people you have no probable future contact with. You'll probably, hopefully you'll see them again. Hopefully there's follow-up. Hopefully there's an exchange of contact information. But you'll probably never see them again. Again, I ask, why not do both? Each has tremendous advantages. With relational evangelism, I can especially show gentleness, patience, and long-suffering. With stranger evangelism, I can especially show the seriousness and urgency of the gospel. People with varying personalities and backgrounds are uniquely benefited by each approach. People who are good at doing one often have a lot to offer in the other. Think about how much more courageous your relational evangelism could be if you tackled your fear of sharing the gospel with a stranger. And how much kinder your stranger evangelism could be if you learned to patiently share with a stubborn friend. Oh, how often I have prayed that God would give a stranger I had just spoken to, a Christian friend. Lord, I just talked to him. I just shared the gospel with him. He's going home. I'll probably never see him again. Would you please give him a Christian friend? And oh, how grateful I would be if a Christian, even an eccentric, odd confrontational evangelist earnestly confronted my lost friends and family with a warning of judgment and repentance. And why not be realistic about the need for both? There are almost 8 billion people on earth. We don't have enough time to establish relationships with them all. Life is short, and then you die, and then you go to heaven or hell. 
Jesus says, John 4, Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are ripe, sorry, are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Wow. Wow. Evangelists labor and other people get to enjoy the fruit of that later. Jesus says, others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So when you see someone come to Christ, you are often entering into the labor of what, say, seven other Christians have done to share their faith. Oh, that seven seeds would be planted by seven evangelists and then seven Christian friends would water those seeds in relationship. Do not be deceived into thinking that if you first take the time to establish a relationship with someone, then you can be in a better position to share the gospel with them. Oh, how often this ends up not being the case. You wait too long, and it becomes all the more awkward and all the less seemingly genuine to share the gospel with someone, often out of our cowardice, failed to share the gospel with for such a long time. So, let's do both on purpose. The two approaches are complementary and symbiotic. Each benefits from the other, and we need both. Speaking of John 4, which I quoted from just previously, think of what Jesus had just done. Do you remember the story that's in the latter half of John 4? Or, sorry, the, I guess it starts with John 4. The woman at the well. There were some odd moments where I heard uh, a fancy term, a missiologist, argue from John 4 that we should have uh, contextual, cross-cultural engaging uh, interfaith dialogue with people. And they would extrapolate principles from John 4 about how Jesus is interacting with somebody that Jew would consider a cultist. And he's, you know, the, the manner in which he speaks to them. And, you know, there's a lot to draw out from Jesus. He is a master communicator. Sometimes he plays the trumpet loud, and sometimes he plays the flute. And the way that Jesus takes this conversation, what always struck me is that the people who were using John 4 to argue for this long, almost exclusively relational evangelism, were using a story of Jesus who went from like zero to 60 in 30 seconds. <laughs> Woman, would you give me some water? Later he says, if you knew the water that I have, you know. He, you know, people talk about methods of evangelism to go from the natural to the spiritual. Well, you could say he did that, but he did that in like two sentences. He hit that quickly. And then he confronted her sin. Uh, and yet he was very winsome with her and at the same time very confrontational with her, very pointed with her. He called her out you know, on her bluff, on, on her, her distracting response. Um, but he pointed her to himself. Jesus was a stranger evangelist. By modern standards, what Jesus did was very awkward and countercultural. So I invite you with me to join Christ if, if we need to be. Let's be awkward. That's okay. Sometimes we can swallow the weirdness and the awkwardness of having a conversation about the gospel 
with a stranger. And we can have Jesus as our master, our example, our Lord in that. So, as promised, I'd like to give you some practical tips every week that you can use the same day. Again, nothing profound or complicated. Um, It's okay to have formulas or templates to start with. I'll share something like that every week. I'm not worried about giving you a formula because you'll take it and you'll adapt it for yourself or you'll pick parts that are useful. I have uh, more or less a formula on the street when talking with people to get to the gospel. I like to ask, what's your faith background? Um, Do you go to church? Are you religious? Uh, This is especially when I'm in a more direct mode of evangelism, if you're feeling especially bold. What is your faith background? Um, Do you have a religious upbringing? And that's, if you notice, I've not yet asked them what they believe now, yet. I'm asking them about their background. So you might ask, like I do, where did you grow up? Uh, what's your religious background? It seems like a, like a, a, a people, some people who don't like talking religion can sniff where you're going with that. Mm-hmm. And I do not like being a car salesman. I like getting to the point very quickly. I'm not trying to slide into this. I, I'm, I like to be pretty direct. Then uh, I like to ask, do you go to church anywhere? Or what do you believe now? What are you now? What, what, of what faith would you consider yourself? And then, say, if they answer with, I'm uh, a Mormon, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, um, I might ask them um, something to the effect. I ask this a lot. Maybe this is a Utah-centric thing. What's the biggest difference, you would say, between your worldview and the Christian worldview? Maybe a better way of saying that is, what's the biggest difference between that and Christianity, would you say? What do you think are some of the biggest differences? between what you believe and what Christianity teaches. And here is a question where I'm kind of, I'm working toward this question. This is my, my, my <laughs> this is the tool in the tool belt I go for often. Um, have you ever heard the gospel summarized before by a Christian? Or if I'm feeling a bit goofy, have you ever met a Christian evangelist before? Um, Have you ever heard the gospel explained before by a Christian? And what's so good about that question is that whichever way they answer it, it's so tremendously useful. If they say, yes, I have heard the gospel before, I have heard it explained, then you can simply follow up with, what did they say? My goal is to get the gospel on the table fairly quickly. Or at least something that will get me there quickly. I want them to explain to me their understanding of the gospel. Because even if they say they go to church, this is downtown Kansas City, even if they say they've had a Christian background, they will often answer with something to the effect of, well, I just need to be a good person. I need to do the Lord's will in my life. That's not the gospel. So, there's no need to be reactionary. You can listen. You be kind. You can often respond then by saying, well, would you mind if I explained it to you? Sometimes you don't even need to answer that. They can look at your face and they say, well, what do you think it is? <laughs> and that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. It's really not complicated. Have you ever heard the gospel summarized before? Explained? What did they say? And then you could work off what they say, perhaps often build off of what other Christians have communicated, or you can offer to explain it yourself. And this is where we'll work together to try to have on our tool belt a, say, two-minute gospel summary that you can give at a moment's notice. That's probably one of the best skills you can learn as a Christian. And it's something you could practice with each other too. Can I summarize the beautiful gospel in a minute or two? Of course you want to explain it for 30 minutes. 
but can you explain it in a minute or two as an introduction? If they say no, and this is often the case, this was such a great question to teach visiting evangelism teams or youth groups in Utah. I'd ask them, uh, I'd tell them, look, you guys don't need to debate Mormonism uh, often. You don't need to go back and forth and hash a lot of things out. You might, it might come up and it might be the faithful thing to do in a conversation. It might be the need of a moment. But most of these kids have never heard the gospel. So if you say um, to a Mormon or to anybody, this works with anybody, have you ever heard a Christian summarize the gospel before? And they say no. Oh, how provocative to your heart. Oh, how stirring that you, at least to their, to their memory, are the first person to ever summarize the gospel to them. Wow, this person is unreached. They've never heard the gospel. So it's so helpful to your heart to not assume that they've understood it or heard it, to know that they just simply need to hear it. And then again, I can say, would you mind if I did? People usually oblige. Sure. It would just take me a minute or two. That's where I try not to lie. (laughs) I have to pull myself back in. Um, I'll repeat this in future weeks, but another question I would ask um, to this effect was, um, have you ever had any Christian friends growing up? Um, Or family? Uh, And attached to that, I'd ask, uh, did you ever talk about matters of faith or God? And it's really interesting. uh, You have to watch yourself not to use too much Christian lingo that might just, just yeah. so you're keeping it super simple. Again, this is less like seminary and more like the repetitiveness of Awana in Sunday school. Mm-hmm. Talking to someone who's, say, 50 years old, who is uh, less spiritually equipped than your kids.